Okay. Okay, everybody. I would like to welcome uh, Gwen Wyckoff to the show. Welcome to High Frequency Radio. Gwen, how you doing? I'm doing good, and I'm glad to be here. Great, great, great. I know you told me Frank, he's uh, uh, just a little tied up right now, but he's going to be coming on shortly as you well. And, uh, here he is. I'm here. <laughs> hey, Frank, hey, how you doing? Good. I'm doing real good. Great, great, great. Uh, let me uh, 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 extend a warm welcome from High Frequency Radio, and let me just introduce you to all the guests. Hi, everybody. This is Frank Ozak. Did I pronounce that correctly? That's correct. Oh. Okay. And Gwen Wyckoff, um, they are uh, two individuals who are extremely, extremely knowledgeable about common law trust. And uh, you have a website. And, and a book, actually, that you have written on this subject. Am I correct? Uh, no, we have to be technically correct. We are contributors oh. to the book. Oh, you're contributors. Okay. All right. Okay. The, All uh, right. Lawsuit, the lawsuit we were in, uh, they accused us of writing the book, and that was a huge legal point. And one other, one other thing is a book. Two oh, books. Yeah. Two books. Two books, two books, two books. Well, are these books still available? Can people still get these books? Yes, they can. Due to the battle, yes. Okay. Can you you want to go ahead and put that out there where they can get these books? I, I'm I'm sure they're very interested. <laughs> Try to find out where to get them from. Frank, you want to tell them? Yeah. Okay. You can go to uh, Passing Bucks P A S S I N G B U C K S dot com, and there. There is a world of information there on the common law trust. There's also uh, information there on uh, the battle we did with the DOJ and the IRS. And you can see the initial paperwork that was presented to us, and you can see the final judgment. And we can no longer uh, aid people in putting a trust together for them. That means we can't physically put it together. We can't physically put it together, but we can assist them, help them put it together. Yeah, we can uh, uh, pass on to you our knowledge. And and then also, uh, which would really key into what was what's going on, they can go to YouTube, and this video is also on our website. You can go to YouTube and just type in my name, Frank Ozak, or Gwen Wyckoff, and uh, uh, uh a video will come up by Ben. That was we were interviewed by Ben Lowry right after the uh, DOJ settlement, and uh, it's an hour and fifteen minutes long, and it'll give you the hard nuts and bolts of uh, what we're doing and how the how the court case went, how the uh, discovery went, because it's all, it's very complicated. <laughs> you know, that's how I um, uh, came across you. I uh, saw the Ben Lowry. Uh, interview that you did and I was like wow um, that's very interesting and then I shot over to the website and uh, you know went through the information and I said I'd like to have these two people on my show and uh, you were scheduled to be on the show prior to this everyone and everybody already know I did a public apology but there was a mix up and you know and so I just want to say one last time uh, I wanted to extend. I'm so sorry to you know for that mix-up that occurred uh, last time you were scheduled to be on the show. That was 100% my fault, and I, I'm, I was deeply troubled about that. So I appreciate you agreeing to come back on the show today. I want to thank both of you. Okay. Well, you seem to be a guy who's on our page, and uh, you know we all get overwhelmed, so we can forgive you. And then a lot of people out there that are looking for trust. They, you know, they, they want to try uh, a Massachusetts trust. They want to uh, try a Kentucky trust, a Florida trust, a, a what's his name's trust. And there's one thing that has that is not available to them is a trust that has gone through the battle. And Charles Arthur Enterprises, which is a trust which owns the copyright for the art of passing the buck, and the DOJ already knows this. They are a trust that has gone through the battle. And it is, they were, it was proven to the DOJ and the IRS that the, that distrust is legal in the eyes of the federal government. Okay, well, let's just start, let's start from here. 
What is a common law trust? Let's start right there. What is a common law trust? It's one that is put together as a contract by the people that in reference to the Constitution, Article 1, Section 10, we have the right to contract. And there are certain specific uh, legal precedents that have established the parts of a trust, but it's the right of the people to create their own trust. You don't have to go get permission from somebody else. And it, uh, and a common law trust, which is irrevocable, it requires at least one trustee who's not related to the person setting up the trust. The person setting up the trust is a grantor, and he has to do it for the beneficiaries. It's actually really, really simple. But what has occurred because of the extreme power of the common law trust is the dark side of our government has wanted to twist it all up and make it very complicated and very hard for the information to be put together. And there's a lot of uh, disinformation agents out there who are who used to, and I don't think it's as common as now as it was when we started this, they used to like to tell people, uh, you can hide your assets, you can do this, you can do that, and all that. And uh, the way they structured it was to make people put their assets into a trust so that the IRS could take them. So we went in and we researched everything and um, figured out when they can do that and when they can't. And the trick is you have to have at least one trustee not related to the grantor and at least one beneficiary. But in between those two statements is volumes of information. And so it's basically the right of contract under the United States Constitution that gives people the right to set up their own trust without asking permission from the state, from the government, from anybody else. That that contract basically is with the settler of the trust or the grantor of the trust and the first trustee. Yeah, that's where the contract is. And as far as the uh, government is concerned, it can be set up in such a way, like Charles Rucker Enterprises, that it is outside of the jurisdiction of the United States. Oh, wait. Let's talk about that. Let's get some clear. What does that mean outside the jurisdiction of the United States? What are we talking about here? What what does that mean out, outside their jurisdiction? I thought they had jurisdiction over everything. Uh, yeah, they think they do. <laughs> <laughs> the federal government was hired by the states to administer interstate commerce and uh, banking and a few other a few a very few other things. Um, and the states are sovereign. The states are actual countries recognized in the world. Like if uh, France wants to do business with California, France is doing business with a sovereign entity. California is a country, which, you know, is left out of the school books. Uh, so the federal government has, which is owned by the royals and the international bankers, by the way, and it's a separate corporation. And to make sure that they confused everybody, they named it the United States of America, but that's a corporation. And that corporation administers certain things to the states. So a common law trust is part of state jurisdiction. It's not part of federal jurisdiction unless the grantor or the trustees make it part of the federal jurisdiction. And we train people how to uh, administer their trust so they can have a choice as to how they want to do business with the trust. They can do business inside inside the jurisdiction of the United States or outside the jurisdiction of the United States. And in our book, The Art of Passing the Buck, in Volume One, there it it there's a lot of information on jurisdiction uh, in the appendix and Chapter 16 and Chapter 14, and just loaded with things that that just covers jurisdiction. It may say privacy or it may say has the right, and these rights are founded in uh, the IRS code and in the Constitution. I've uh, been uh, around and around with the IRS, and uh, the thing that I've noticed is uh, they don't touch a trust that is not in federal jurisdiction. 
and that's basically how we won our case because the uh, well, first thing they came after Gwen and I, and uh, DOJ and the IRS came after Gwen and I for putting the book together, and because we assisted in um, uh, putting the book together, and we do not own the copyright. I, uh, Charles Arthur Enterprises owns the copyright. That one, they found out that uh, they had the wrong people. So the judge didn't want the case in her court. So she told me, go to discovery and resolve this. So one, we didn't go to court because we were looking forward to going to court, but we would have had an audience there. <laughs> and the, the, the second thing was, is after discovery, they found out that Charles Arthur Enterprises owned the uh, copyright of the book. And Charles Arthur Enterprises, which is which is a trust, is outside of the jurisdiction. So, what, what are they going to do? They can't do anything. It's outside their jurisdiction. Now, this book has to be a powerful book to incite the ire of the IRS for them to, um, uh, you know, train their eyes on you. How did how did that happen? How did they find out about you? What, what you know? Because we're selling we're selling our book to the public. <laughs> they don't want that. They don't no, want they didn't want that. Yeah, they, they, we, we've had some other dealings with them, and actually there are certain agents that are really, they don't like our names. So I think that's part of it, too. Wow. Yeah, I, you know, it, w the stuff that's in this book is really from hardcore experience, uh, being in court. And doing the battle, doing the battle on taxes, doing the battle on this, doing the battle on that, and so we're we are a group of people, like at least ten people, who have contributed to the stuff in this book, and we also emphasize how to raise your children to become leaders in your family, how to raise your children to become beneficiaries that bring put money back into the trust how to raise your children psychologically, what the rich do on how to raise your children. Uh, we give you tons and tons of experience with trusts and dis distributions and how the rich do it and how the poor do it. And we even recommend reading Rich Man, Poor Man uh, by Kawasaki. So, uh, and we... You know, it's we wrote volume one so that you never had to go and buy volume two. Vo vo volume two is very pricey and it's big and it's heavy and it's got tons of court cases in it. You don't have to go there. Just get volume one because volume one will give you so much information so that if you want to sit down at the computer and, and do just a living trust on the computer, you will have tons of information on how you want to write that trust. Yeah, the way the current system is set up, they want every generation to start over again from scratch. In other words, not have any money in their pocket and go out and get a job and work and be on the wheel the rest of their lives. But if you have your children set up in a trust at an early age, they leave the family and they have a few coins in their pocket and they can go. To, they can start in the world uh, not from scratch, but having something in their pocket. And they can perpetuate the wealth of the family just by doing that. Uh, now, now, now I was going. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I just said it. I was. This. This just brings a question to mind. Who would? Who could benefit from a trust? Who is this for? Because you know, I, you know, I'd already come to the conclusion. You know, I study this stuff myself. And I see that, in my opinion, is how everyone really should be kind of um, conducting their life around it. Because this is where this seems like where privacy uh, has its most power inside yeah. of trust. Would you agree with that statement, or you know, yes. could you expound on that? Um, there are certain ways of. First of all, the grantor puts. We never recommend somebody putting all their money in a trust because they really need to have their own cash. But once you put it in a trust, it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the trust and administered by the trustees. So if it doesn't belong to you, there's no paper trail that it leads back to you. So how much more privacy would you like? That's like the ultimate. And uh, so when assets are put into a trust, let's say you put your... Uh, Let's say you got a duplex, 
that you're gonna that you've been getting personal money for for a long time. Uh, and you decide you're going to transfer the duplex into a trust, and there's two trustees, and they're going to administer it. That, that means they're going to be the property management company, or they're going to hire a property management company. And you've got these renters, and they're paying their rent. Let's say they're paying $800 a month, and so you've got $1,600 a month coming in. You used to have it coming into you, right? But right. now it's coming. Now it's coming into the trust. And the trust has a whole different financial structure. So now you don't have that $1,600 a month to declare on your income tax, right? So your income tax right. bill goes down considerably, right? And then right. within the trust, the trustees do the do their thing uh, according to the rules and regulations of trust. And, uh, but you as a grantor, first of all, now you don't own it. And second of all, your liability has gone way down. And then one other thing, caveat you can add to that is, say you own more than one piece of property. One piece of property is bringing uh, funds into the trust. The other piece of property is maybe you had a vacation home that you just leave out there and you go there once in a while. But if you put that in trust, you have the right of use, and the beneficiaries have the right of use. And you could have three or four different homes all over the country or all over the world that were in trust. You had the right of use. But you don't have the right to sell it, but you can go there any time you want to, even even cars. You could have the right of use of, of a brand-new Mercedes, a brand-new BMW, a, a, a nice Lamborghini. But you, if you don't own it, but you have the right of use, I mean, it's almost like owning it. <laughs> it is. It's, uh, it's, it's a b- much better way of living. Yeah, this sounds like the old adage, own nothing, control everything. That's what we're dealing with right here. Well, in that particular case, that was either Rockefeller or Morgan or one of those big guys who said that. I've heard it so many times you'd think I'd know who said it. But um, it's it's kind of not really exactly true because uh, if you don't really control it, the trustees really control it right. because the trustees really own it. But the grantor can be an advisor. And in, in the big trust, in the in, where the big boys play, uh, that statement's really true because they'll kill the trustees. But with the little trustees, with the little trust, we're not. Gonna <laughs> <our trustees. laughs> okay, well, wait, wait a minute. But wouldn't the indenture or the declaration of trust dictate what the trustee is required to do as a fiduciary to the beneficiary? Um, because obviously, this thing is called a trust. So right. you got to find somebody you can trust. That's what it means, oh, right? Well, yeah, one thing you have to understand, in a common law trust, it's outside the jurisdiction of the United States. The only thing that applies if it ever goes to court is the indenture. Any other laws that are up, that are on the books for a state or a government do not apply unless it's, unless it's really inhumane. The indenture is the rules and regulations of the family of, of the trust. Uh, the um, grantor sets out what you can do and what you can't do, and it's pretty specific in reference to, let's say he has a son that's disabled, and uh, let's say the kind of disabled is sort of like he's a psychopath. Now, the grantor uh, realizes that someday he might end up in prison or something, or he might end up in a mental institution. So he writes into the, the indenture, his wishes on how to handle a situation like that. The indenture is very personal to the to the family. It's how the wealth is passed on through what's called trust certificates. It's how education is to be handled. Um, in some in our trust, what we always recommend the ones that we had. Uh, recommended to be set up. We always recommend it for one thing, that your children are encouraged to learn accounting. There's nothing more valuable than understanding accounting to handle money. And if you're going to be a beneficiary or become an officer of the trust in the future, that's kind of one of the things that's very important to know, even if you're going to own your own business. So so there's certain you the grantor has a choice of setting up certain rewards certain encouragements 
like uh, it, you can get extra capital units because you have a child or whatever. You know, these are all. Or you've taken some extra classes in school to that would benefit the trust, and also it has uh, provisions inside it which can be included inside the trust in case you have run into a problem of substance abuse. You can your beneficial uh, uh, rights in the trust can be withheld until you clean up your act. Right, and these are all these these are all spelled out inside the trust indentures. So when you get, uh, let's say, there's been companies that have, and we like these companies because we've seen these these trust indentures. <laughs> we've you know stolen some of the ideas, but uh, there are boilerplate trust indentures. And it's it's okay to get one of those because you can kind of design your own way of doing it, but uh, don't use it as a boilerplate plate because there's absolutely no way you could do it for your family as a boilerplate. You have to put in your own stuff. You have to know what you're doing. You have to focus on okay, if my grand this is for my grandchildren. What what can I put in here to, to ensure that they're going to be uh, well taken care of. And by the way, when a baby is born inside a trust, it, it becomes uh, vested immediately. It has its own capital unit. So as the child grows up, he's already a member of the trust and already entitled to participation. It's not like mommy and daddy withholding, uh, torturing you, not telling you what your inheritance is. Yeah, and in the bigger trust, the children are always uh, the children are introduced to the trustees, and the trustees are make, uh, and the children know that the trustees are there. Try to instill with them that the trustees are there for them in case mama and papa goes away. And as they get older and they go out into the world, the financial issues of the trust are part of their interaction with the trustees, not with their parents. Well, let me ask you this. If I, if I were to juxtapose a trust with a will, what are the salient features of each and why would you recommend a will or, or can they interact with each other or can you just tell, the, tell people what is the distinguishing characteristics of these two uh, entities? Okay, you have a will, and you're, you've written it up, and you said your house goes to child A, and your uh, antique collection goes to child B, and your bank account goes to child C, and so on and so forth. Um, and you die, and they, and they pull out your will, but you forgot one very important thing, that in order for the goods to be transferred to your beneficiaries, uh, you need they, your beneficiaries need the authority to take the stuff. So the house that you die in uh, or have when you die is still in your name at the county, and you're dead, and your signature is uh, the only thing that can be used to transfer the house out of the into the name of the beneficiaries, and so on and so forth. So especially the bank account, where you've been signing your checks all the time, uh, and you're the only signer on the check and account, well, that doesn't work too well, does it? Because now you're dead. Well, How is anybody going to get your money? One thing you can do in, in a will situation is uh, provide a power of attorney to an executor. If you do not do that with a will, it goes into probate, and the court will assign an executor of the will. And, of course, the executor is going to probably be one of the judge's friends. And you know how that will go. Well, it could be an <laughs> honest guy, but he's still got to get paid. So so a will uh, is, is much better than nothing, which is intestate. But um, the, it, it's, uh, it's awkward, and if it isn't... If, if there isn't two signatures or two signers or two owners on everything, which is a living trust, then a will is sort of a uh, – it, it works. We wouldn't tell you not to do it, but it's very awkward. And then the next step up is a living trust where there is those dual, uh, duplicate signatures. So if one person dies, the other person has access to everything. So that's the difference. 
Oh, okay. You're irrevocable trust, of course. You you don't own it. So the trustees, which are perpetual with the trust, have total signature power, and it goes on and on and on, and nobody dies. So you don't have the well, probate the, the, problem. The grantor could die, and the beneficiaries, even the trustees, could die. But there's always somebody waiting in the wing to step into that position. Except for they can't step in for the grantor because once the grantor dies, uh, those powers get transferred to the trustees. Trustees automatically. Oh, that's okay. That's good information to know. Let me change channels here real quick. Let's let's talk about patriot mythology. Okay, we got a lot of people. <laughs> we got a lot of people out there who like every time I look around, somebody's putting together a trust. Somebody's putting together a trust. And when I started studying trust management, I was like, man, this don't look like this is some easy stuff. This is um. Uh, you know, this is some, and it's very interesting. It comes naturally to me because once you understand jurisdiction and public and private, um, it kind of just flows with me. It just everything is just. I understand the court cases when I read them. Um, why the judges rule in certain ways. I understand minimum contacts, all these different things. But give me your insight on this. What are the patriots thinking that they can do with these trusts, and do they have the right idea? Or do you think this is, you know, they they just got the wrong perception about this entire thing about the word trust? For background, uh, one is that Gwen and I both in the early 90s became citizens of California. Yeah, state citizens. <laughs> so we are we are very entrenched and, in and the... We, and we have numbers that can prove it. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're very entrenched in the whole patriot thinking. And uh, so for us to get into the trust business, we had to realign our... Are things <laughs> so? Uh, one of the things is that um, the state citizen uh, movement was about jurisdiction, a hundred percent. It it said it taught us the difference between the federal jurisdiction and how the income tax played in the issue of jurisdiction. And uh, we both, Frank and I, sat at the feet of Richard McDonald and listened to the court cases. And I don't know, I must have done that for or seven years. So uh, we we understand the thinking and we believe the thinking is correct. We wouldn't argue with that. We would argue with the fact that reality is quite different than how the laws are written. Um, there's an awful lot of people that are not associated necessarily with the state citizenship movement, but they are very, very keenly interested in the taxes and getting out of taxes. And they understand that the income tax is uh, questionable in its uh, legality. Uh, and so they look at a trust as to get out of taxes, and they don't know how a trust gets you out of taxes. But it, it's usually a tax thing when a patriot comes and wants a trust. And the trust system is set up for beneficiaries and long-term gain. And if you if you follow that logic... If you follow that desire, if you think of your grandchildren when you're setting up a trust, you get the benefits that we mentioned before, which is, you know, you put your assets into trust, you don't own them, and so you don't, you know, you're not taxed on it. Uh, but, um, first of all, patriots usually are in a rush to get a trust. They want to get one immediately, which is not possible. A real trust is like fine wine. It has to distill. Tremendous amount of education is needed to be able to walk between the federal and the and the state jurisdictions. You have to know, when you're filling out paperwork for a trust, you have to know what words to cross out and what words to replace with trust. And I mean, there's, there's unbelievable details. And uh, to to keep your status as a as a state-based trust, um, it's just a huge amount of information. But patriots are usually in a panic. Um, they usually want to have their money, their trust now because there's some big amount of money coming uh, eventually. And uh, let's say that's true. Let's say they are going to get a big amount of money eventually. You still ha you have to have your trust in place and operating and a bank account to receive the money long before you get the money. And uh, I think in some states it's as low as 18 months, and other states it's like three years. Before a trust is, uh, I don't know what kind of legal word they use. But, you know, seasoned. 
seated, seated, S E A T E D. Uh, so, you know, there's tremendous amount of information about trust, and if I'd have known about trust, I would have only done trust. You would have <laughs> only done trust? That's all you would have done? Yeah. <laughs> I never would have done anything else. I just would have done the trust. And that's uh that's my now I'm gonna give you and we're gonna we're gonna go into some questions um and we're gonna talk about Puerto Rico for a second because um when I, <laughs> when I got into this um I got into it dealing with the criminal justice system and I found out that everything was a tax uh, I don't know if you're aware of it now but the IRS has their hands in everything because the Federal Reserve are basically would you agree that our government is being run by the Federal Reserve. No, it's being it's being run by the banks and the big corporations. Yeah, the, the corporations. I, I thought you were, that was redundant. I, it's actually being run by the Royals. The Royals. Yeah. yeah the Royals. It, and, the I, and the Vatican. And the Vatican. Because I saw yeah. or, or, I, I, when I was studying. Um, this information. I came across some information where this individual, he had pulled his individual master file, an unsanitized version, and found out that he was categorized as a drug dealer coming out of Puerto Rico. And so he wrote the commissioner of the IRS, and he, you know, he sent him a certified mail letter uh, requesting a response and asking why this was, because he's never been to Puerto Rico. He said, look, I've never even been to Puerto Rico. Why <laughs> do you have me flagged as as this right here? And it never came out. About they, the drug dealer, huh? <laughs> and, and this has come out that they basically have categorized almost everybody in the country like this. So, yeah, because um, they can. Because that they was can. What, that this was one. Can. That was one question that the uh, DOJ posed to us during, during uh, discovery. Is he says it says here that you have it's it's in uh, volume two that uh, uh, the the seat of the IRS is in Puerto Rico. And they said, well, you have to pull that out of the book. That's not true. And they did the research on it on our footnotes in the book, and they found out that it was. And they come come back to us and they say we we withdraw the question. Well, they didn't admit to it. They just quit. Insisting on getting dropped out. You know what's so funny? When we were in discovery, there's a bunch of paperwork goes back and forth, and they accused us of this, and we deny this, and blah blah blah, and go on. And each time they did this, their paperwork got less and less and less. <laughs> it's very very funny. But if anybody wants to look it up, it's on the uh, it's on the internet. It's an 18 page article by William Cooper, um, and it's. Uh, under the title of uh, BATF, you can put BATF in a search en ed engine and put William Cooper with it. It'll probably come right up. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm putting it in. Uh, can, it's a I'm putting it in the chat room. room. Pardon? I'll oh, go ahead. I'm putting it in the chat room right now. Um, I've read it before. I know what you're talking about. William Cooper wrote Behold a Pale Horse. For all of you out there who don't know who William Cooper is, he wrote a book called Behold a Pale Horse. He's a next Navy, uh, Navy uh, military officer, and uh, who was exposing a lot of information uh, uh, that was uh, the general public was one, uh, unaware of. But, he was one of the uh, first to really big whistleblowers out there. He was. He really was. And that and behold, a pale horse is still relevant today. That book okay. is still relevant. I go back okay. and read that book now and still pull stuff out of it. Yeah, I knew him personally because I uh, ran the magazine Perceptions magazine in the in the middle nineties, uh, uh, and uh, he had Veritas out at that time, and so he and I would talk on the phone. Oh, I love that man. He was crazier than a loon, and he was a uh, you know he drank a little too much, but my heart just I just loved him, and uh, that's how come I was so intimate with this article because when he discovered the uh, executive orders and all the stuff that created the uh, IRS in Puerto Rico, he he and I were on the phone talking about it. He was so excited because that's the toughest stuff to you know dig out, and so the actual article in Veritas is on the website and. Uh, so you can look up, you know, Veritas would be another uh, another keyword, 
it's it's so there. It's unbelievable. And C A J I Newswire Service. It's it's all there. You'll find it. What's interesting, um, I have some associates who have some IRS problems, and they found out that the IRS agents don't even know the law. And I'm going to have Sherry, I'm going to have Sherry Peel Jackson. She's an ex IRS agent. She's going to be on the show uh, next month on the eighth. And um, she was on the uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie by Aaron Russo's uh, from Freedom to Fascism. Right. Right. Uh, she's the she's the lady on there who um you know would try to get the fifty thousand dollar bet <laughs> to, to just say show us the law that says we have to pay income taxes. <laughs> Talk about that and see if you agree with me. I say that you do have to pay income taxes because that name that they are taxing is not you. It is a it is a franchise of the United States. An individual is considered a corporate entity. Would you agree with that, or or not? No, I, I would. I would simply say that they're bigger than you. <laughs> they, Basically, they just, if if you look up the word income, it always refers to the IRS code. So if you have income, and it is, and you declare you have income, it is taxable. Well, so if you don't have income, is it taxable? You have to be. Well, anyway, well, I, can't, I can't go there. So right, 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 right. <laughs> right, 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 right. Okay. Um, okay let, me, let, me, let, me, let me just say this about that. It doesn't even matter whether you have income or not. Once you got a number and once you filed, you're screwed for the rest of your life and you can't get out of it, even if you go to court, because the judge will be killed if he rules in your favor. So, you know, you can go through all the kinds of paperwork you want. You can jump through hoops. You can, you know, threaten people, whatever. Do You're going to have to pay your income tax because you filled it out the first time, period. And they don't care, and they don't have to care. They own you, and an IRS agent doesn't have to know the law. They're there to break you. They only exist to break you and to hound you. They do not exist because of any other reason. So, you know, all your paperwork, you might as well burn it. Until the government changes, it isn't, you're not going anywhere. I'm sorry, that's black and white. And now you speak from hardcore experience. Yeah, I had a um, a gentleman, he was the president of the Republic of Texas. Have you heard of the Republic of Texas? Yes. Um, he actually got arrested, and I, I met him in jail. Actually, when I first started learning this years ago, and he told me the same thing. He said, it doesn't matter. He said, there doesn't matter about the law. He said, they're going to do what they want to do, you know, and he, you know, and it, it was, it seemed like almost he was kind of broken a little bit, but, um, he made me aware of some things. Uh, one thing that stood out of my, out of my mind, he told me about the mini essay and he talked, he, he talked about how when you go into court, if they don't say court is in session, you're in chambers. He, he taught me a lot of stuff. But he basically he said the same thing that you're saying that they just don't follow the law at all. You know, it's like once well, they, they they follow a sort of a guideline. If the law is not on the books, they'll make sure it gets there by the time you go to court. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Frank and I have both been there, done that, and uh, but we're supposed to be talking about trust, so let's get back on. Yeah, that. yeah, let's get back to that. All right, let's get back to that. Question. It says um, in the latest, they got some questions from some some individuals. They said in the latest audio on the past in the bug site, it was mentioned about the IRS Puerto Rico Trust Connection. Other than what is available on the web, is there any self authenticating hard documentation evidence I could acquire to learn more about this? I guess we were just talking about. Uh, yeah, we just talked the, about that. We we just talked about that. Okay, and let's see what else we got here. Um, uh, in a previous interview, Gwen mentioned that it was by pure luck that your battle with the Department of Justice was a success. How effective is the program described in passing the book at defending a common law irrevocable trust from comp- compromise? Then, then uh, the answer to that was we were lucky that the judge could recognize from our initial paperwork that we had a substantial argument and probably recognized that we were not the ones who who owned the book. 
So in order to get such a twisted and sticky situation out of her courtroom, she turned it over to discovery. And that means it's not in the courtroom. You settle it with the DOJ attorney outside the courtroom. And the uh, the DOJ attorney was really shocked that she did that, by the way. And also, it, it, it's on our website in the DOJ uh, win versus win uh, section that the signature of the judge, the judge has final signature on all the paperwork going through. So the judge agreed to the final stipulation against Gwen and I. All right. So the other luck was, and I give uh, the DOJ attorney, and you can get his name on the website if you want to, I give him full credit for acknowledging the law, obeying the law, and following the law. Because when we showed him the laws, he he would back down, he would remove it from the table, uh, and we were able to, so we were lucky with the judge, and we were lucky with a, a good attorney. I mean, he he was excellent. Um, but we had to show him it in black and white what the laws were. And, of course, there's nobody in the federal government that has uh, a huge background in press law. They're, they, this kind of situation just doesn't get that far. So we have we had all the court cases and we had all the background and we had all the IRS codes and we just laid it on them and kept laying it on them and kept laying it on them. and then the thing just kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller on their side. So um, we were very lucky in that sense in, in that they did obey their own laws when it, it was laid down and showed to to show to them and then they tried to accuse us of a few other things but it was just silly because the paperwork and everything else just showed that you know we were doing trust to help the family uh establish themselves to hold together for generations that's what we were doing we weren't doing anything else we weren't putting trust together for so people could avoid could evade paying income taxes in fact the most safe place for people if they're going to get a trust, the safest position for the grantor is to continue paying your income tax because then they don't look at you and then they don't investigate the trust and, you know. And so the grantor's income tax will go way down, but, you know, as long as they keep paying it, the the likelihood of them being investigated is, you know, nil. So then you got your trust and that's a whole different ballgame. So don't draw attention to yourself, basically, right. <laughs> is what you're saying. Really quiet. <laughs> um, are there any cases in particular that stand out of in your mind that, you know, the listener could go and research for himself or, you know, just want to – I know you probably have some of those in the book, but is there anything that stands out in your mind that is like uh, just this case, like you can see right here that this was a well-put-together situation? Or anything yeah. like that. One that's, one that's in our book is uh, Betts versus the Commissioner of the IRS. Oh, yeah, that's the one I was just going to mention. <laughs> you know, Frank and I are so often on the same page. Betts, B-E-T-T-S versus the IRS Commissioner. It's an old case. I think it was in the 40s. Uh, and it went on and on and on. The IRS tried every which way to break that man. Oh, man, did they try. And he had a trust. And he had a trust, and he... he set up the trust and he was the grantor but he hired two trustees so on that particular trust were three trustees in that particular case the grantor can be a trustee as long as he doesn't own it he owns it in a collective situation and he must have had buco money he must have had a lot a lot of money he was an investment uh he he made money out of uh he was a stockbroker is what he was and he had a mother and a sister and somebody else who were his beneficiaries, and they were receiving from his trust a monthly allotment, a monthly distribution. And um, he never took a dime for himself from the trust. And this trust was set up totally correctly, absolutely to the T. And the IRS tried to break it, and they, they tried three times to break that trust. And so if you read that court case, you really get the flavor of the intricacies and also the standard, absolutely standard robotic procedure 
of the IRS and trying to break a trust. Uh, it's a core piece of information, and anybody who's interested, they really should read that court case. Wow. I mean, I, I just wrote that down. I'm definitely putting that on my list to go and get and pull up. Um, one more question from the audience. Um, where was that at? Can a trustee be the majority exchanger in a common law uh, trust? And what? first of all, what is a majority exchanger? Okay, the, when a person puts money into the trust or a house into the trust or a car into a trust, they exchange it for what's called trust capital units. And a trust capital units are treated legally just like stock certificates, which means that they don't have any value till they're cashed out. So you, uh, so let's say the trustee. There's two kinds. There's two levels of this kind of trust. There's one for the very rich, and then there's one for the me middle class. Okay, the very poor. They don't have any money to put into a trust. So <laughs> no use in doing a trust. So we'll say it's a it's a very rich trust. We'll say it's one of the uh, billionaire trusts. In that particular case, the trustee buys their position. And in buying their position, they get the majority of the trust capital units, which is the law. The trustee has to own 51% of the trust capital units. Now, they have to own the majority. Uh, there's a whole, diff it's a whole different uh, ball game in how you separate that 51% uh, if you want to have more than one trustee. But, but no other exchanger can have any more trust capital units than the first trustee. Right. So, uh, in the middle class trusts, where people don't have that much money, they have, you know, maybe uh, 800000 to fund the trust, okay? Uh, and that isn't cash flow, that's, you know, goods like a house and other things. So they do, don't have a lot of money to, uh, they don't have enough assets to attract those heavy duty high end trustees. In fact, they don't even know anybody in that realm, but they do have friends that have a good background. And so a friend may step in and be the trustee, but they don't have money to invest into the trust to buy the capital units. So they also get, they have, in order for the trust to be substantial and, and substance of transaction, they still get the 51% of the trust capital units. And so the trustee holds 51% of the, what's called the corpus of the trust. And one of the things also is the trust that has something, say like a patent or something like that, is holding a patent, and somebody wants to buy into the trust and wants to offer more money, and say the trust capital units are, say they're each worth $100 each, and he wants to put in, a, say, $100,000. So that would be buying more than what the trust capital units are worth. He can put that money in, and what happens at that particular situation is is that the trust capital units split. Well, it, that's a really complicated yeah, it's thing. It's a really complicated thing, but it's just like a preferred stock splitting. It's like preferred stock splits, yeah. Right. And it's a, a, a matter of fact, it's ran very similar to a corporation that, in, that issues stock certificates, uh, the Definitely. difference being that the uh, stockholders, they have some say-so um, uh, uh, but in a trust, particularly uh, uh, irrevocable trust, the capital unit holders don't have any say so uh, of how the trust is operated. That's all 100% uh, done the by the trustee. Yeah, the trustees are the only ones who hold voting units. But uh, so anyway, the trustee always has to have the 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 majority. Now, what has happened in some of the trusts is. These trustees come on. They didn't put any money in, but they got they got the trust capital units. And then the uh, grantor and the beneficiaries they start whining and complaining, and they uh, they're unhappy and they want it all back. Well, they want it all back minus fifty one percent, and the trustee didn't put in anything, so he gets fifty one percent of the cash out because he owns the capital units. So that stops people from. Uh, cashing out their trust. The purpose of the trust is to have it last for generations. So this particular situation with the trust capital unit stops the desire to to uh, cash out the trust. Wow, that is an ingenious um, 
uh, <laughs> method of, of doing that. You know, I, you know, you just taught me something right there. Uh, I, I never thought about that, but that definitely would uh, prevent someone from being desirous to pull out, uh, to cast out. Uh, well, it stops, it stops a lot of people from getting a trust also because we like to call it the white man's disease. It's mine, and I don't want anybody else to have their hands on it. And they, if they put it in trust, yeah, it was theirs, but now a trustee owns trustees own 51% of it. And this is absolute fact in law. When you start getting into trust and start dealing with it, um, the, and they start talking about uh, trust capital units, they, these people, they lost their court case because the trustees didn't have 51%. Well, no, I mean, Betts was a statutory irrevocable trust, so they didn't have trust capital units. But uh, in an irrevocable common law trust, there's plenty of cases. I mean, they were listed in Volume 2, and some of them are listed in Volume 1, where, you know, you, it, 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 this is interesting, speaking of that. You know, you say the bank is the trustee of my trust, my statutory trust, and it's irrevocable, and the bank is the trustee. That's been taken to court. The, the banks cannot be trustees because they cannot take 51%. They can only get seven. <laughs> now, is that like a – is that – okay, so is that – is that – does that in any kind of way – uh, like when we deal with these real estate investment trusts on Wall Street, because people are getting foreclosed on left and right, and the bank says they are the trustee uh, for uh, blah, 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 2007 trust, blah, blah, blah. Are you saying that they, that's impossible? They can't be the trustee for that trust? That's right. They can't because they're only getting 71. They only get seven. As a trustee, a bank will only take 7% of, a, of the, that's the maximum they can take by law. I, I, it's in volume two, that particular. That makes report. sense. That makes you sense. Know? I've read some perspectives where they, I, I think they get like about 2%, 3%, yeah, something they're like not, that. It's not, an ir, it's not an irrevocable trust and they don't own it. <laughs> wow. That's some good information. I hope everybody out there caught that jewel before it hit the ground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this is the kind of stuff. I mean, we have Frank and I together. We've been managing trust, building trust, doing things for I don't know. Sometimes we say ten years, sometimes we say fifteen, because we kind of really don't more than that now. <laughs> and um, we we have all kinds of those little kinds of pearls. So uh, and if you want to get volume two, that means you're real serious about putting together a trust. Let me tell you, Volume 2, which has a huge amount of information in it and will drown you, is nothing compared to what Frank and I know. Uh, one thing, I don't know how much longer we have, but uh, before we go, if people go to PassingBucks.com and sign up for a free gift, there's a gift it's on the left-hand side, uh, uh, we'll trap their email address and name, and we'll be sending out, we send out newsletters every now and then, and that's how maybe a lot of people are hearing this right now. But uh, this coming week, we'll probably have a special on the book. So they can get in, uh, get their name if they're on our e-list. They will get a, uh, uh, an email. Uh, with the code. With the discounts code uh, for buying the book. Yeah, the, the printer of our book gave us a great big bonus and screwed up on the glue on the binding, and so we have books that have just a little tiny bit of too much glue on the first page and the, and, and the last page. Everything else on those books is absolutely perfect, and no one would know about this except we can't uh, afford to sell defective stuff. And so there's a discount. You can either get one without the glue problem or you can get one with a discount with the glue problem. And so if you sign up uh, for a free gift, we'll be sending out the discount code shortly. Okay. Now, one one last question, because uh, uh, this just came to my mind in listening to some of the things that you were just saying. When If, if someone was to hire you to do a trust for them, how much responsibility do you do you put on them to learn things? Like I know some people, and what they'll do is they'll put the trust together but they say, hey, look, you got to buy this book, and you're going to have to learn this book, too. You're going to have to know this stuff. Are they required to know it, or is this, oh, well, just put the trust in me. You well, do everything for is, me. 
we're not going to be there to defend them. We can, they can buy the books, they can read both books, and we can, they can hire us to, on an hourly basis, uh, as a support to help them put their trust together. But we will train them and their board of trustees on how to manage a trust correctly. And once they go, and if they have a problem, they can call us up and ask us questions, but we're not going to be there to defend them. Their board of trustees is the main core, and they have to know it. And that's basically, we were putting trust together for people before, and we had one trust go out of here. It was 35 pounds of paper. And the people got the book. And they had them for five years, and the only thing they did was sat behind a box of books, and I'm protected from the government because I have these books. They never did bother to read them. So this is the trust books, not the art right. of passing the book. This is the trust books that we put together for them. And we also went to their board meetings every once in a while and gave them some more education. We also told them exactly what was going to happen with the IRS. We also fed them everything they possibly could know, but did they ever bother to pick up a law book or anything? No. Did they ever think that they were on the line? No. Did they ever think that their assets were not protected, not because they didn't have the right paperwork, but it was they were not protected because they didn't have the knowledge? Oh, boy. What, what yeah, a mess that was. When they were attacked, uh, they resisted for a while, but uh, after a short distance, they caved. Yeah, and they never learned so many of the things that we had told them, you know. So uh, it was like, oh, well, there's not much we can do. So therefore, that's one reason why we decided not to build trust for people anymore, because if you don't know it, you're going to get hurt by it. And uh, by us educating people and duplicating ourselves, we want the people to know exactly what we know. If I could take Wait, a brain well, I, I got to just interrupt you. I, did, did everybody out here there hear what he just said? Before I brought you on the show, I was having, uh, you know, I have clients, but I don't do trust work or anything. But I got accused of um, uh, basically uh, my integrity was attacked. I didn't complete a job for someone. And it was the same thing you said. I don't do it anymore because I said I, I would take individuals. I would sit them down. I would say, here, this is what you need to read. Um, here's the paperwork that goes with it. You need to read this stuff. I can't, I'm can't. i not going to be there. I cannot defend you. And I got out of the business and, and just started just showing people how to do things themselves because it seems like when you do it for them, they'll end up attacking you. You know, I would get attacked, you know, if, if I did it for them. But I said, okay, well, look, I'm going to make you respond responsible for your own stuff because I, the way I look at this, especially when dealing with private information, I think at the core of it is there is responsibility. A, a person is responsible for his – when you do private things, that means you're not taking any benefits or, or privileges from the government. You have to learn how to be responsible for yourself. And this is what I see is, is lacking in, in the American society today. And I guess this is going to be a good little segue, Gwen, us to go into what we were talking about last night, but would you go ahead and talk about that a little bit? What? You mean uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 did you, uh, do you mean that article I told you on the other yeah. website? Yeah. You know, you know what, what's happening with the planet, you know. Uh, I don't you, know if you want you to talk about that, that or not. Did you look it up? I can tell it up on Kettler's website right now. Looking up, you want to put up, you want yeah, you want to give him a plug real quick, John Kettler. JohnKettler dot com. Uh, that's an article on his website. Uh, there's five articles. They're short uh, under the subject of vampires, and uh, it's information released through the Rothschilds, uh, and it's an explanation of how the planet is has run uh, and who the Rothschilds really are and the politics of the vampires in reference to Earth. And that's all I'm going to say. Well, well, I mean, you're, 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 listen, I've been studying this for 25 years, uh -huh. and everybody on, on this show wait, wait, wait. Hold, hold on, hold on. 
Frank does. Frank says we cannot talk about that. So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. We want to talk about it, but it's an interesting thing when I when I um uh about responsibility. You know, the responsibility of individuals to learn information for themselves, and that's what I'm seeing. I I saw that there seems to be some sort of something in the American people where they, uh, you know, they don't want to take responsibility for things, you know, and that's what this, this look, uh, it's almost like some type of lethargic type something. And that's just what I encountered, uh, you know, and, 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 and it, you know, and I didn't like being attacked like that because it's like, look, you know, I'm trying to do everything I can for you, but there's going to be a, some type of, uh, uh, responsibility to rest on your shoulders to know this information. So that's why I just kind of brought that up about the trust. It's like, okay, do they have to know this information? Okay, so just put my paperwork together. I got a trust and everything's all good. Uh, no. In fact, the fact that you have a trust makes you more, uh, more of a target. I mean, it's more of a, more of a target. So that's why if you get a trust, you keep your mouth shut. Right, that's interesting. Yeah, that's, so that's if you're helping. gonna if you're gonna be putting together a trust, you only talk about it with your family or your trustees or whatever. You know, you don't go out and brag about it or anything. You don't say anything at all. So let me ask you this about filing paperwork. Some people say, well, you get a trust and you can file some paperwork into the public, maybe the Secretary of State or file the indenture or something like that, does any of that paperwork get filed or does it just, you know, you just, you don't need to file anything like your indenture, they put the state on notice, well, this is a trust and it exists. So how about that? Is that violating privacy if you do that or is that yeah, something that you shouldn't do? Let's say you have a uh, laborer who's going to help you build your house. And you have a private contract with that laborer, with a, the general contractor of the person who's going to buy the house. He's building the house, you know. You have a contract, and you, you both sign on the contract. Do you have to file that? Nope, you don't. Because it's a private no, you don't. contract, right? Well, there you go. What's the difference? Well, I said that, too. I said that, too. I said you don't file anything <laughs> anywhere. It's a private contract that is protected under the Constitution of, with your right to contract unlimit, unlimited. Uh, so I'm, I'm 100% in agreement with you. Okay. Well, okay, um, I'm not going to hold y'all all day, but what I did want to do, I want y'all to give another plug for your uh, your book and uh, what it is that you do, anything else that you want to uh, put out there. This is your opportunity to, uh, you know, just to say it. I'm giving you the floor right now. Okay, the first book, Volume 1, The Art of Passing the Buck, is for everybody. And especially Grandma and Grandpa I should read this because they probably have their uh, stuff set up in some sort of format or maybe they haven't even done it yet. But it talks uh, not only about all the different kinds of trust there are and how to raise the children, but... It talks about what happens in old age when people want to bribe the nurse to, you know, you know, there's all this stuff. My father even did this. He gave a house to my to uh, one of his nurses, and because he had listed the house in the uh, trust that he had set up after he died, she had to give it back. Uh, but there's all kinds of experience situations in Volume One that everybody needs to have. So I recommend highly that you get on the website, sign up for the free gift so you can get the codes in case you want to get a little discount on your book. Now, Volume 2 is only for those who are students, who will study the law, who will look up the court cases, who really want to get deep into it, and who really think that they are going to set up a trust. Um, There's people that... um, get the books, the volume two, just because it's a heavy reference book. And they just want to have it in their library in case they ever need it. And there's other people who have been studying trust for ages, and this information is all in one place. They don't have to, you know, try to dig it out of all 
all the places we dug it out of. And it gives a tremendous amount of experience. Volume 2 also has the paperwork, the initial paperwork you have to put to put together the trust. And it goes into tons of things. It doesn't have the indenture in it because we didn't particularly want to give the indenture out to the government. But it has how to put the trust together. It has all the paperwork. It has all the parts of an indenture in it. It has all kinds of things. And... Um, one other thing about Volume 2, Volume 2 is a training manual, and even if you have a trust, even, uh, Volume 2 is good to, uh, you can use the Volume 2 to check out your own trust to see if it has all the correct parts, and also use it for the administration of your trust. Yeah, and, and yeah, any trustee would love to have that book. It's a huge amount of experience. And Volume 1 is also a huge amount of experience. It's how to handle difficult beneficiaries, how to handle special beneficiaries, you know, how to how to pass on your wealth so that you get to keep it in the family. Yeah, when I when I first started studying trust, um, you know, I was just under this impression. Everybody said, well, you put together a trust. And I was like, go get your bank account. And I was like, okay, uh, I'll just get me these trust documents and um I'll put together me a trust, go give me a, a EIN EIN number for the trust and you know, and hey, uh um open me a bank account and I have a trust. And then when I started studying this, it was the it was the administration and the management of the trust that is significant and important and makes a very interesting study. And this information is not widely available. Would you agree with that? I think we have the only books that are written on the subject. Well, there was there has been other books that were written before, but if you go and do some research, like uh, the Common Law Trust Book was written back in the uh, early early nineties or late eighties, and uh, the the OJ IRS went after them, and uh, the book is no longer no longer in print. And they had a lot of uh, information in there that was extremely invaluable, valuable, which we uh, took out of it, and they had a lot of information in there that was very very dangerous. Such as in that particular book, they wanted they said the managers of the trust, which would have been the uh, grantor, uh, kept most of the power, and it just lined. It, it, it's not true, you know. The the trustees have the the legal power. The ta- they have to handle the taxes. They have to handle all the contracts. They have, it, it's a huge amount of stuff that the trustees have to have knowledge about, and that the the grantor to keep himself safe can't sign any of those documents. The grantor cannot sign the checking account, cannot sign contracts, cannot deal with any interface between the trust and any other entity. But he can, you know, tell the trustees what he wants and how to do it and all that, but he can't put his signature on anything. So in the in this other common law trust book which really helped us, they had a big section in there on trust capital units which really helped. Um they were saying that the manager does all that stuff. Uh uh-uh. uh, no, no. <laughs> Cannot do that. You know? I um I, I have to agree with you one hundred percent. I I have a trust book myself on common law of trust, uh and it was written in the eighties. I have not been in and I'm a researcher and I can't find nothing on, you know, anything like even close to what I got in 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 uh, in this book. Um, it's not the same kind of trust that you're dealing with, but it. I know how hard it is to get your hands on certain information, and so that's why I had you on the show because, um, you know, I would say, okay, these people have to know something, and uh, that information you have those books. I'm sure that's invaluable. I, I don't know if my listeners may um, can comprehend this, but if you're going to get involved in trust, you know, information like that, you have to you have to be a student. And it, this jurisdictional thing, I think, would be the biggest thing. What would you say is the number one thing people have to understand? Well, that's one. One is one is, is they're not uh, putting a trust together for to evade or avoid income taxes. They're putting a trust right. together for their beneficiaries. That's the most important thing. And the jurisdictional issues are secondary. And some people choose not to move outside of the jurisdiction of the United States. That's okay. That's that's a, that's a choice that they have to make for their own trust. 
but it's for the family. It's not for to hide. It's not for beating the government out of taxes. It's for a much, much bigger purpose. And as long as it's addressed that way, all the other benefits, and there's a huge amount of benefits, uh, will fall into place. So, uh, you know, one of the questions the IRS, the uh, DOJ attorney asked when I was being deposed, that's it, it was a six-hour deposition I had to give. He he couldn't understand why the names of our trusts were uh, not the names of the grantors. And uh, I, I explained it to him. I said, a trust is for the history of the family. So we tell people to name your trust after your uh, grandmother's maiden name or somebody famous back there to incorporate the history of your family into your ben- so the beneficiaries will know something about where they come from. And he was, he looked at me like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Where was he going to go with that, right? But that is the truth. That this is about the family, about the family history. And I tell, uh, I have a video on the uh, on our website. It's called uh, "Survival Through Family Unity," and I really, really emphasize that uh, particular part of building up a trust. And I take people into the future so they can see what the future would look like on the third generation if you set up a trust today. And in there I tell on my personal life a trust that I inherited from, and I tell that I never knew, I knew the name of the guy who set it up, but I didn't know his history, and it always, always bothered me. I wanted to know who he was and how he did it, and I wanted to know everything there was about him because I was the third generation. I didn't know him. He was dead. So it was very, very important to me. So that's why we incorporate that into the trust. Wow. Wow. Okay. I actually um, uh, read some IRS uh, documentation, some things where they were saying that the purpose of the trust has to be for um, a uh, 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 I, I guess it, this is not for business purposes. I, would you say these trusts are for business purposes or for, or for holding assets? And is there a difference between that? Yeah, there's, between that, you, there's a court case. It's in Volume One. Uh, I don't have it right in front of me right now, but uh, it talks about that particular issue. A judge had to make a deci- decision on whether the trust could hold a business or not, and the the decision from the judge was that a trust can be a business if the beneficiaries of the trust did not put any assets into the trust, did not contribute to setting up the trust. That's also the truth with uh, partnerships. That also applies there. So, yeah, a trust can be a business as long as the beneficiaries did not put anything in there. But uh, a business is sort of like a side box. You you have one box for the management, which the trustees and the executive secretary sit in. And then if you want to, uh, and and they administer to things that are income streams. And then if you want to have a separate business under the umbrella of the trust, you put it in a separate box. So, uh, and always make sure the beneficiaries did not contribute to the initial corpus. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. I mean, you just you you hit you hit me with some interesting things for me to think about because that's a that's a I guess you dropped one another one of those jewels you say you got a lot of uh, because the uh, because that kind of that kind of rains on my parade a little bit because we were thinking about putting together a trust for business purposes, um, you know, something I guess akin to a real estate investment trust, um, yeah. you know, for investment purposes for to for community projects. Um, would um, these type of trust, excuse me, would these type of trust sit that bill, or am I talking about something a little different? You know, where because now I'm seeing, okay, well, how do you court investors if the if the beneficiaries if the uh, 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 beneficiaries can't contribute to the court, uh, trust corpus? You know, then that that to me, I guess you'd have to arrange it, set it up in a certain kind of way. But you, do you understand where I'm going with that? Yeah, you're getting you're getting apples and oranges all mixed up. 
you okay. got to get a management trust first. You got to establish your trustees. You have to establish your initial corpus. Then, under that management trust, you can put your LLC. You can put your business. You can put this. You can put that. But you have to have the management trust set up first. It's called a uh, trust structuring. It's in it, and it's an art form. And that's where the consultation comes in to how to draw the lines. But we do, uh, in Volume 1, we take you through a basic trust structuring lesson through uh, up through uh, Chapter 4. We have the diagrams and explain it all to you. But without the management trust, you're, you've got to start there. And the management trust is the key thing. It's, it's the key thing. If you read a book, it's called... Uh, the rich and the super rich, uh, what's his name? Uh, Ferdinand Blumberg. Blumberg. Uh, he, he went ballistic. He was a professor and he kind of went ballistic over the anger, uh, of the rich and how they structured their money and all that. And, and there's certain parts in that book where he can't figure out how, how they can get all their, you know, you, you can only hold 9% of the corporations. And because if you own 10% of the stock, it goes into some other taxable thing or privacy thing or something. I can't remember. I read it a long time ago. But he couldn't re- he couldn't figure out how he could get all the holders of the corporation to vote in, in concert because he didn't know about the management trust. He didn't know about how it was orchestrated. Everything is orchestrated through the management trust. And I like how you said that it's an art form because I did recognize that that it is an art form in trust structuring. I actually went to a seminar. These other guys, they were um, they had they were doing common law trust. But they had they had a, some a certain a, some sort of scheme where they were trying to structure the trust. It was so long ago, I don't remember. I don't remember exactly how they did it, but it was exactly what you were saying right here. There has there has to be a certain way that this is put together. Um, and I guess this is for, for I guess, to um, stave off liability or things like that or to compromise the integrity of the trust. Would that be correct? To keep the integrity of the trust from being compromised. Okay. You have to do right. it absolutely correctly or you're going to mess yourself up. And it's uh, it, well, I'd like to I'd like to a little point of clarification for you and your mm-hmm. audience. If you completely understood we have just, what we have just said, then you didn't understand what we said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, know, you get into trust structuring, and that comes after volume two. And uh, after volume two, if you think you know what you're doing after volume two, then you better call us. Because if you want to do some trust structuring, we, there's no way we can put everything we know in Volume 2. But we're not even going to talk to people unless they've read both, both, both Volumes 1 and 2. We don't even ac- accept them as clients. We don't even give them a consulting contract. You have to read both volumes. And we know you can't read Volume 2 and really understand it. So we say you have to be familiar with it. But you have to be very familiar with the first five to six chapters. Oh, now, see, that's very interesting. See, that's, a, that's something that's important to know. I think I'm going to adopt that policy myself. You cannot talk to me until you read this book right here. <laughs> you have to read this book right here, then come talk to me. <laughs> right. that makes, because it would, that makes, it would be a waste of time. Because people are so mixed up that, you know, there's nothing we can do. Right, right. Frank, you had something you wanted to say? No, I didn't. I, I, well, I just want to thank your audience and you and your audience for having us on. I, I just clicked on my uh, clicked on the email and I see about ten or twelve people have signed up for the free gift and uh, gotten on our e list and uh, they'll be getting the code uh, probably tomorrow or the next day. And uh, I looked. I just looked at our website also, and the code is there. So. Uh, I didn't think our geek was going to put it up, but he put it up, and that just means he's going to have to take it down in a, probably in a few days. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. I want to I want to thank both of you also, and before I let you go, I just want to stress this to my audience. I want to stress if you because I got a lot of brothers out there, um, Moorish brothers and uh, other individuals out there. And this trust subject is a very very important subject um, that comes up. 
in dealing with trust. And I was kind of like one of those people who did not appreciate the complexity, the intricacy, the, um, uh, the attention to detail that is required when structuring a trust. And I've since come into that appreciation, and it's a very interesting subject to me. It's, um, you know, because I have this propensity for uh, legal matters, and this is just because it's a science. And that's what I like, and that's what it should be treated like. It's an exact science. And um, um, I want to stress to them that whenever you come across information um, like what they are offering right now on this program, I'm going to suggest that you get your hands on it because it's going to be very, very important information that's not going to be easily found. You're not going to be able to get this. This is not something you just go on the Internet and Google and, oh, here, here I found the information. It's not anything like that. You're not going to find this type of information like that. You're going to have to um, get your hands and get acquainted with someone who is going through it and uh, who knows what they're doing. And then you're also going to have to take time to read and study the subject matter and get this well, material. I want, to thank, I want to thank both of you uh, for coming on the show today and uh, sharing your wisdom and your insight in this particular matter. I really, really, really appreciate it. Um, and go ahead and give your information one more time, uh, you know, so because, you know, we may have some people who just came on the show and so forth, and, you know, give all your information. Okay. It's, uh, the name of the website is the uh, is passingbucks.com, and make sure you sign up for the free gift uh, there. That way you'll get put on our e-list to – uh, get more information uh, than what is on the website. Uh, there's a lot of information on the website that people should uh, read, and if they're really serious about trust, and plus all of a sudden, if they get in our e-list, we, we only send out stuff on privacy and uh, trust information. I'm, you're not going to be overwhelmed with it. We probably put out, uh, I don't know, one a week or maybe sometimes one a month. So we're not, you're not going to be overwhelmed with a, a bunch of junk. And uh, they can go there, and also we have we're gonna we do it's already posted on the website that uh, we have a promotional offer for some books that were uh, over glued uh, that they can get a discount on. We only have a limited supply of those, and uh, once they're gone, they're gone. And there's information on the website on getting those. So. Uh, and also, we have a phone number, and a, the phone number is on the website. And just like I said, you know, Gwen and I were probably in this uh, eight or nine years before we even thought about putting the book together, books together. So we really got our feet wet on it. And just like I said earlier, I want to thank, thank you and your audience uh, for putting up with us. And hopefully, uh, everybody has learned something, even us. <laughs> We have we've enjoyed talking to you folks. So thank you for listening to us, and you know you've got us on our favorite passion. Well, I definitely. I mean, you've already said a couple of things that just set my mind to, um, you know, you you dropped, you you said some some very good things. Trust me on that, because I am a student of this particular subject. I in no way, shape, form, or fashion do I claim to know even a ten percent of what I need to know about the structuring of, of a trust. But, um, you know, it's coming. I see the complexity of it, and uh, it's something that I definitely want to get deeper and deeper and deeper into, and I felt like it would be incumbent upon me to bring people up on the show who, who had been involved in this a very, very long time and make people aware of what it is that they were getting into when they decided to get uh, deal with a trust. And I want to thank both of you from the bottom of my heart for coming on the show. I appreciate well, it. Well, I thank you for having us. and. Uh... So I've enjoyed uh, dripping some of my jewels. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate okay, you it. I appreciate it. You two take All care, right, too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.